another experiment in Belgium on dupe trans patients, poor patients. So, um, I should know it by now. <laughs> My concepts are that, and I think the concepts of all of us now, are that the only surgical goal is to regain and maintain a normal range of motion or a maximal range of motion of the fingers. And that we uh, are dealing with the disease, Dupuytren's disease, or Klein's disease for that matter. And it's like rheumatoid arthritis. So su surgeons don't cure a disease. They just treat it. So, and if the patient is symptom free, I say he is, a, he is in a state of remission. When I meet a patient and I diagnose this problem, I say, now you have the disease and you will have it the rest of your life. It may be, become symptom free for a while, um, uh, but uh, it's like Dr. Smith said, and Dr. Bulstrode was actually uh, apparently his, his uh, resident. He's the one that uh, had the very intelligent uh, expression that uh, the disease symptoms will recur as long as the patient lives long enough. So I had to correct uh, that, thank you. Um, and surgery, does it mean that uh, in the future we will treat it as a disease? That means we will give medication? Probably, I think so. I, I'm convinced we will, but we won't, uh, I'm not working against my job. <laughs> I would if, if that was necessary, of course, this is ethical, but uh, I still believe that surgery will be and remain the first uh, line of treatment because the patient will always present with a contracture. He will never come and, well, he will, but not, most of the time he will not present before the contracture. And on the other hand, uh, I, I also think that the decision for medicine is not something to be taken lightly um, because, uh, of course, medicine uh, can have side effects and some of them serious, like death or something, which is a serious side effect, I believe. <laughs> um, anyhow, most of the patients will uh, need simple treatment and will be successful. It's just the patients with a high diathesis that are at risk and may uh, need another treatment. What we want to avoid is revision surgery. We all want to avoid revision surgery because uh, operating and uh, cleaning out the neurovascular bundle uh, out of the scar tissue is really a risk and we don't want to take too many risks. So I got inspired to give the patients tamoxifen uh, through basic uh, science research on desmoid tumors, which is also a fibroblast uh, tumor. And desmoid tumors are already treated with high-dosed tamoxifen. So that's where I got the inspiration to risk this. I knew uh, there was clinical experience and patients survived. Um, on the other hand, lab experiments uh, on myofibroblast contractility uh, in Dupuytren's disease has, have shown that tamoxifen specifically prohibits the proliferation and contractility of these cells. After a long way uh, through the Ethical commis Commission, and uh, maybe I was lucky that one of the board of the Ethical uh, Board was uh, had Dupuytren's disease, I don't know, but I, at, at the end I got it approved. And we did a randomized controlled uh, trial, double-blinded, and we used a concert method. And we gave uh, tamoxifen a neo uh, in a neoadjuvant way. That means we started six weeks ahead of surgery and we continued for 12 weeks after surgery. Tamoxifen is an estrogen, uh, so it's actually female hormone. It's quite difficult to give that to, to male and then in a four double dose. So it's uh, kind of uh, difficult to explain that to the patient and uh, also to the ethical board. Uh, I did it in high, very high risk patients to make sure that within a, a certain amount of patients I would have a, a difference uh, if ever there was one. And I just used a standard segmental fasciectomy again uh, with a, a standard, our standard splinting program which is not that important. And we had a, a follow up, we are going to have a follow up of two years, it's not finished yet. We excluded risk patients uh, for embolism because this is the risk, of course. If you take hormones, you can easily, uh, you could get an embolism. The clot, but blood clotting could be higher. So it, I mean it when I say there is a risk to medication. You could die from it. I always say that to the patient. Uh, luckily, uh, it has never happened. Happened, nor did it in the experience with the tamoxifen in uh, desmoid tumors. But it is a risk, and everyone should uh, be told. 
On the other hand, uh, if patients had cancer, I won't give it. Uh, if they had no al allergy, I can't imagine any one of the male patient knows that he has an allergy for tamoxifen, but uh, you have to ask. And on, I always explain to them that this could in, uh, change the, the, how do you say that? Pot potency in English, I don't know. Fertility? P fertility, no, the, the, for the male. Im yeah, it could give change of potence, not impotence. Uh, it could also get uh, more exciting, actually. Um, and if uh, women are, <laughs> are fertile, I won't give it because you never know, they might get pregnant. Uh, I just wanted to, for a minute here, show you why I uh, take the high risk population based on the clinical parameters. I also looked for uh, a biopsy parameter, which would be interesting. If we take a biopsy and we see a difference, then we could say, oh, this is a high risk patient and, and, and maybe um, uh, have a more aggressive treatment for this patient. And actually, I didn't find a difference. We, we, we published this article uh, on beta catenin staining. But uh, if I look at other articles, I must say that there is no real difference, uh, I believe, in the biopsies taken from patients with recurrent and non-recurrent disease. But on the other hand, um, when we looked at the risk factors of the patients, we did see uh, the, sa the similar, we had similar findings as in the literature where we uh, saw that the risk factors as uh, described by APE really had an important link with uh, recurrent or non-recurrent disease. Um, where there's really without risk factors, uh, very low risk, uh, uh, much lower risk. I mean, it's not very low when you have a recurrence risk of 38%. But uh, on the other hand, if you have all risk factors present, you're almost sure that the disease will recur in a reasonable time. So we, we use the APE score. Um, family is not, so the, the, a positive family history is not included in this score. Um, probably statistically, it was also our finding, it is taken into account with the other scores. So if you examine the patient uh, and you have a high APE score, then they, there is a family history. And if the patient doesn't mention one, then very often uh, maybe the, the patient doesn't know it's of his family. Again, digital monitoring. And all uh, PIP joints were included. I mean, there was not a patient with only an MCP <coughs> contracture. And um, they were monitored. And when they had multiple digits uh, affected, we always uh, take the, we, we really compare the most severe one, and this is mostly the, the, the little finger, because as we demonstrated and as we all know, the PIP joint of the fifth finger is really the most <coughs> difficult one to treat. <coughs> this is the particip participant flow. We have a follow-up now, preliminary of one year, and this was really an interesting adventure for a surgeon to do. I'm happy most of the patients get operated because if we, if I would have to give medicine to all patients, this would be very interesting. It was first difficult to include patients if the male come to uh, men come to uh, out patients and you say, okay, you have to prevent disease, and uh, I propose that you take female hormone now, and it's an experiment, by the way. Well, most of them don't say yes, at least not in my country. Um, uh, but after a while, you get uh, better at uh, convincing the patients, and I got them included. Maybe I smile a little more or something, I don't know, but they, they tempted to say yes after a while. But even then, um, I had a, a couple of patients dropped out. One I was, unfortunately, he had a, a pulmonary emphysema I couldn't be operated on. And one just took the medication, went to Paris and said, now I'll have the needles. I know your medication probably works and I'll have the needles. So he stole my medication. I, ah. I, I had to say, I have no financial disclosure. I bought this medication myself. So he really stole my, my medication. <laughs> uh, so he was lost for follow-up. Um, <coughs> Then uh, they were all operated on, and uh, after surgery, I didn't lose one. I lost one in the, I didn't lose a patient, luckily. I, I lost him for the study because he had a severe appendicitis, and uh, he stopped taking the medication. Luckily, the end result was good. Um, and uh, that's it. So, okay, that was enough for the power study. I was lucky. These are very high APE scores, as you see. They have a six. Uh, I, I 
I needed at least five for an APE score. I really wanted to be sure that these patients, these are the ones that are bad after the operation. Within three months, you will have a bad scar tissue, name it scar tissue or Dubitrans uh, myofibroblast, I don't know. But the results, uh, it's still double blind. I don't know who is who, but I've researched uh, nurses and they, with the digital photography, photography, how do you say? Photography system and the uh, satisfaction score can be done anonymously, and I can uh, check in without uh, knowing which patient is taking what. Uh, anyhow, uh, I did immediately see two different kinds of patients. I thought, no, this is optimistic. This is probably not true. Until I saw the results, and it's the patients with tamoxifen were almost all corrected completely. I had two patients with an insufficient correction, and one of those didn't have one on the table. He had an insufficient correction of the, uh, on the table, he had a fuller plate contracture, and I stopped. This was also seen in the, in the visual analog, uh, analog scores for satisfaction, and of course the relative to, uh, index for the correction of the PIP joints. Uh, we saw it in the total joint correction, and we saw it also in the PIP joint correction itself. This is uh, very preliminary. Um, this is not 100% sure. I haven't had any statistics. You see that I didn't have a full correction in a tamoxifen uh, patient in, in one, and then um, apparently uh, there is a rebound again uh, after three months, and uh, apparently in the tamoxifen it was uh, less. Oh, other side. I never learned this. We had side effects. We had a carpal tunnel syndrome in three. I thought, this is probably the estrogen. This must be patients with tamoxifen. I have four patients. We are really convinced uh, that they had impotence, um, sleeplessness in two, weight gain in three, hemicolectomy after appendicitis. And luckily, because of course now I have the results, luckily these are Side effects of placebo, if we give placebo to patients, apparently we have to warn them for the side effects. So I was uh, relieved because I thought at the beginning this must be the patients with uh, tamoxifen. You're really getting uh, uh, paranoid uh, when you're doing this. Um, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've said few, but maybe uh, it, it still is dangerous to give it. Uh, I mean, it, it still is hormone, so it might be a false uh, ease. At one complication, and after one year, I st uh, I've uh, revealed the tamoxifen uh, blindness. Uh, the patient doesn't know yet, but I've, I've seen the results. And uh, it's one complication with tamoxifen. This um, patient had a serious wound problem. I don't know if it's because of the tamoxifen. I don't know, but I, I should mention this. He had a full extension, which is good for the results, but he had a very important granulation problem with a, uh, uh, and I had needed to do a tenolysis and a pulley reconstruction even, and that's uh, why he hasn't got a full uh, uh, flexion now. So I think that tamoxifen might might work. Um, I think it's very important uh, that we consider it, and I now use it in extremely therapy-resisting patients. The question is now, of course, can we ever discontinue? Now we're getting uh, more and more to case reports because uh, there are patients that, that are used to not be able to treat anymore because they have a current disease, severe problems, and now I say, okay, I can suggest for you to take tamoxifen. And I had a, a female patient last week who started to take the tamoxifen uh, uh, about eight months ago. And she had a severe recurrent uh, Dupuytren's disease. I did an atrodesis of the PIP joint in the fifth ray, and she was very uh, good at taking the pills. She, she really did it and, and continued, and the, the disease really completely disappeared. There were no symptoms anymore. It was even funny to see her arthrodesis because she had no symptoms of uh, Dupuytren's disease. The funny thing is, she, she then decided to stop. I said, that's your choice, of course. I don't know if you have to continue or, or not. In Desmoids, they never stop. And she had a recurrent nodule within four weeks. She then started the tamoxifen again, and the nodule is uh, a couple of weeks later. It was half the size, and it seems like it's uh, going away again. I don't know. I might be optimistic. These are preliminary results. We have to uh, look at the outcome. 
uh, later on, and of course I will publish the results. But I do think that this method is a good uh, model for clinical testing, uh, like uh, Dr. Cherisic uh, mentioned, if uh, the basic scientific researchers have suggestions for medication, I think we should test them this way. And uh, that's one of the messages, I think, from uh, this uh, gathering that Dr. Eaton has uh, as, as organized, I'm very grateful because this is the start, I think, of uh, real translational research. Thank you.